That's actually not bad. I could wait. No, wait. That's god. This is the. This is my account where Anemo sucks. <laughs> I'm running Razor and Noel teams. I don't need Anemo for anything. God. God. Hey everyone, it's Jinx, and I guess I'm starting to come to terms with the fact that I'm a Genshin math guy now. So, in yesterday's stream, where he went over a giant treasure trove of data and testing from the R. K. Ching Main's Discord server library, by the way, link to them in the description if you want to come check out their library or come hang out, lots of really cool people over there. But during the course of the stream, I realized something, which is that it is apparently not nearly as common knowledge how elemental mastery and how elemental reactions work in this game. Now, understanding how this work is fundamental to how you build your team comps and how you build your characters and where you invest your resources. In fact, I would argue understanding the fundamentals of elemental reactions is more important than understanding how the math of attack percentage and such in the previous video works. Now, to keep this video short and easier to understand, we are only going to be covering the basics as well as just the core mechanics and why it's important to understand these things. Otherwise, for things like the in-depth math analyses of comparing reaction builds to mono-element builds to Venera or Petra support builds, etc., we'll cover that in a future video. Quick aside before we get into the content, I do want to point out that these videos take me a while to make and I'm still sick, so my production cycle is pretty slow. I have well over 20 videos I am currently scripting out and working on in terms of doing the basics and the core mechanics and team building and everything in Genshin. So if you want the most up-to-date information or early access scripts, just follow me on Twitter, I post all that stuff over there. And if you want the absolute most up-to-date stuff, I pretty much lecture and rant constantly while I'm streaming, so just check out my YouTube streams when they happen. I spend like 10 to 20% of my time during streams actually playing the game. Okay, so let's talk about the basics of elemental mastery and elemental reactions. We'll start by talking about elemental reactions because having a core fundamental understanding of the mechanics of elemental reactions is very important to understand how and why we use elemental mastery and who we put it on. So when you use a character's skill or an attack with an infused element, you do apply an elemental status onto an enemy. You probably already know what these are, they're going to be Pyro, Cryo, Electro, as well as Wet. Now this game does run a 7 elemental system, meaning there are 3 more, which are Geo, Anemo, and Dendro, but we'll talk about those in a bit because they function differently from the first 4. So these first 4 elements, whenever you hit something with an elemental attack of that element, you apply the status. This will put an icon of that element over the enemy's head. We call this the aura element, essentially the first element on an enemy. Now, putting an aura element on an enemy has very minor effects. Like, for example, cryo aura will make them slightly slower, like a tiny reduction in movement speed. But these are so minor, I don't really pay attention to them. Now, this aura element does have what we call an elemental gauge. In other words, it does have a certain amount that goes down over time and goes down when certain reactions trigger with it. But explaining exactly how the elemental gauge works and what things cause what to happen is quite a long topic, so probably future video. Note that some enemies do have innate aura elements, like ice slimes are always going to have the cryo aura, as well as fire slimes fire aura, etc. When you burn this aura element on the enemy, they tend to refresh it every half a second to a second or so, I haven't actually measured it yet. But how do we burn this aura? Well, when you add a second element on top of that, again, through any kind of attack or skill that deals that element, you create a reaction that creates a specific effect. We call this second element the trigger element, and this is a very important distinction to remember, which we'll explain in just a second. And remember how I mentioned that Geo and Anemo are different from the other four? Well, that's because they can only ever be the trigger elements. And in the current patch, we can't actually use Dendro abilities, so the only things that exist are things with the Dendro aura in the game, like wooden shields. So here in the background footage, you can see that the enemies all have an innate cryo aura element on. So when I hit them with the trigger element of fire, it creates a reaction called melt, which essentially doubles the damage of the hit that triggers the reaction. There are two different kinds of elemental reactions. There are what we call transformative reactions, and then what I personally call amping reactions. Different theory crafter and testing sources I've seen do name these slightly differently, but the point is there are these two categories. It's a relatively young game, and we don't have any real official terminology yet, so we're just going to go with these two from now on. So Melt is one of these amping reactions. It basically just increases the damage of the hit that triggers the Melt. This makes it very good on things like Deluke or Bennett Alt that deal a very large amount of single fire damage, but make it pretty weak on things like Xiangling's Ultimate, which deals a lot of really small fire numbers. 
At the current moment, the only other amping reaction in the game is Vaporize, and this is Fire plus Water. Now, these always give you a damage bonus on the attack that triggers either the Vaporize or the Melt, however, which element is the trigger does matter. So, for example, if you use a Pyro attack to trigger a Melt on a Cryo Aura, then you get two times the damage, plus some bonuses from Elemental Mastery. However, if an enemy has a Fire Aura and you trigger it with a Cryo attack, you only get a 50% damage bonus. Likewise with Vaporize, if Fire is the trigger, you only get a 50% damage bonus, which is why Melt setups are better for Fire-focused teams than Vaporize setups. However, if you trigger Vaporize with a Water trigger, then you will be getting that 2 times damage bonus, which is what makes Charge Attack Mona Vaporize comp so dangerous. Also, for Klee, the newly added 5-star in the game, theoretically speaking, Melt is going to be the highest possible damage output build for her because she is built around doing charge attacks, which do a very big single fire damage number. But the issue right now is that the current cryo sub carries and supports in the game are awkward to play around because you can only really apply cryo with orbitals like Kaya's ultimate or Chi Chi's E, and it's a little weird. And on top of that, you can't really attack or do anything while waiting for the orbitals to hit the enemy because if you apply a fire aura, then you'll trigger the melt the wrong way. It's weird. But I digress, let's talk about that in a future video about team compositions and such. Anyway, that is going to be the amping reactions. Let's talk about transformative because these are the ones you'll be running 90% of the time. So the big difference between an amping and a transformative reaction is that transformative reactions do a flat amount of damage based on certain stats. These three stats are going to be the level and elemental mastery of the trigger character, the character who has the trigger elements, as well as the elemental resistance of the enemy. That's right, attack, crit, and even elemental damage percentage up does not affect transformative reaction damage. This is both a good and bad thing because it makes it much cheaper to build for transformative reaction damage, but it also means that the damage cap is theoretically lower. Theoretically, the actual curve for reaction damage based on level is actually really high, but we'll cover that in a future video about the advanced mathematics behind reactions. Okay, so all of these transformative reactions are based around either Electro, Anemo, or Geo. Let's talk about the Electro suite first, because that's the majority of them. And yes, Water plus Cryo does create Freeze, which can also create Shatter, which is a damage burst, but we do have a video already discussing how that works in depth, so check that out if you're curious about that. So when Electro meets Pyro, you get Overload. It's basically just a big burst damage explosion that boops enemies back a bit. Now when Electro meets Wet, you get Electro Shock. Now, Electroshock is kind of the weirdest one, and it is also confirmed to be bugged right now, so I don't want to go too deep into explaining its mechanics, because they're definitely set to change in patch 1.1. But the TLDR is that it's essentially AoE chain lightning damage over time that sometimes does the damage over time and sometimes does the AoE. When you get Ice plus Electro, you get Superconductor. This is generally considered the lowest damage one out of all of them. However, it does give you the Superconductor debuff. It also does have this really weird mechanic where it does a little bit more damage if enemies are clustered together when you trigger Superconductor. But again, the thing we care about is the debuff. This debuff reduces the physical resistance of an enemy by 50%, which is a lot. This is why in my previous video talking about cryo builds, cryo reactions, and talking about using Razor or any other physical carry, it's basically mandatory you bring Superconductor into your team. A 50% physical resistance reduction is much bigger physical wipe damage numbers. In fact, I'm currently working on a video about the strongest possible free-to-play team, and the best carry for that is Zhang Ling, because the craftable Crescent Pike amps her physical damage to a ridiculously high degree. Which means even though Zhang Ling is technically a fire character, you focus on the Ice and Electro Superconductor debuff on your team comp. Now, the remaining two reactions that exist in the game are Swirl and Crystallize. This is any of the basic four aura elements, plus either Geo or a Nemo. Again, Freeze and Shadow have been discussed in depth in the previous video. When you trigger one of those four elements with a Nemo damage from like Venti or Sucrose or a Nemo MC, then what happens is you do a small amount of Swirl damage, but then you also spread that aura element to anything that gets hit by the same Nemo attack. This can lead to some really nasty AoE Wombo combos. And then of course, when you combine the Venera 4 set set bonus with this, you just get a disgusting amount of elemental resistance shred. Now, when Geo hits any of these basic four aura elements, you create a crystal crystallized reaction which drops this tiny crystal on the ground when you pick it up you get an elemental shield now elemental shield and tankiness is super cool 
but this is one of a few things that does make Geo arguably the weakest element to run offensively. Because instead of damaging reactions, you make shields. On top of that, Geo just tends to get less multipliers because you cannot reduce Geo resistance with a Swole and Venera set, and you also have less options in terms of increasing Geo percent damage. However, there has been a relatively recent discovery that has made Geo supports arguably overpowered and meta. So the archaic Petra 4-piece set bonus you get from an artifact domain is actually mistranslated, and it's a really bad mistranslation. Basically what it says is that when a character with this picks up the crystallize of a certain element, they get 35% elemental resistance for 10 seconds for the whole team. After very quote-unquote rigorous testing, it's actually supposed to be 35% elemental damage. This is a huge damage buff for super cheap just by running a Geo support with this set bonus on them. The theory crafting community is currently looking into how good this really is and how powerful this can be for team comps, but yeah, that's a thing. Okay, so let's finish up talking about all of these different transformative reactions and how they compare to each other. So again, these transformative reactions deal a set amount of damage based on the triggering element's character's level, elemental mastery, and then also the elemental resistance of the enemy. This does mean that an Anemo support with Veridus and Venera can in fact increase the damage of your reactions of the correct element type. However, in terms of supporting cast, that's pretty much the only thing that does. So this does mean that the Archaic Petra 35% elemental damage bonus does not apply to transformative reactions. Neither do elemental percent cups or elemental percent passives like Lion's Roar. And then based on the type of transformative reaction, there is a set ratio of how much damage they do. So the baseline of one times is going to be Superconductor, which deals that one times cryo damage. It deals increased instances of this if enemies are clustered, but again, it's a weird mechanic. Now, Swirl is a 1.2 modifier, and the damage type is set to the element it is reacting with. Shattered, which is when something is frozen and you break it open with a claymore hit or a geo attack, is set at three times. And Shatter is physical damage, not cryo damage, meaning it mixes really nicely with superconductor builds. At least in theory, I have been told by some other testers that apparently the full bonus is not applied to shatter damage for some reason from superconductor, but I need to test that for myself. And Overload is going to be a 4 times ratio with a pyro damage type, making it generally speaking the best burst elemental reaction. And then Electro Charge is either going to be 2.4 or 4.8, depending on whether the damage over time actually triggered. Again, Electroshock is a really weird reaction with a lot of nuances in terms of its mechanics, and I don't want to get too deep into it here for time's sake, but if you are interested in me doing a deep dive into its mechanics, let me know in the comments and I'll look at making a video about it. MiHoYo has also officially stated that it is currently bugged and will be changed in patch 1.1, so I don't know what it's going to look like then, and I am hesitant to discuss its mechanics at the moment. Now, the exact formula for how these reactions work is not actually yet known, but we are getting close because a lot of CN theory crafters have been making massive data plots to figure it out. Link in the description to this particular Reddit thread if you're interested in reading through all the testing they've done so far. But at the end of the day, the exact formula isn't important. What is important is knowing what things we need to increase in our builds and in our team comps in order to maximize our reaction damage. So I know I have said this several times before in the video, but just to reiterate because this is probably the most important thing you need to learn in this video. Transformative reactions scale exclusively with the level and elemental mastery of the triggering element character, as well as the elemental resistance of the enemy. The one exception to this is that in patch 1.0, currently Electroshock always scales with the Electro character, but that is 100% confirmed to be a bug by MiHoYo and is getting fixed in patch 1.1. Now, you can shred an enemy's elemental resistance, but outside of some constellations on certain characters, the only real consistent way to do it is with the Viridescent Venera set for Anemo supports. And again, yes, this does increase transformative reaction damage. Very nice. And this is where we come to the part where we discuss elemental mastery and how it actually works and why we should care about it and who we should put it on. So the rule of thumb for this is that any elemental mastery you stack and any levels you stack for the sake of reactions have to be on your trigger character, not your aura character. 
Now, there is no 100% answer to is this character a trigger or aura character because it depends on your team comp and how you play and how you time your abilities and elemental applications. But the general rule of thumb is that the character that applies their element the most frequently and quickest is going to be the aura character most of the time. This is why as a general rule, Keijing is a terrible character to put elemental mastery on because she is almost always the aura application, not the trigger. Again, Electroshock currently in patch 1.0 is bugged, so her elemental mastery is what the Electroshock scales with, but that is getting fixed, so don't build for that. A well-played Kei Jing has arguably the fastest elemental application in the entire game. Now, I did recently read about some testing where Jing Chu specifically with Kei Jing does actually make Kei Jing the trigger most of the time because of timing differences, but we'll get into that in a future video. Electroshock is slated to change, so I'm just not comfortable making any recommendations on that until we know how it's going to look in patch 1.1. This is also why the Thundering Fury set on Keijing is actually kind of a trap set because the passive only applies if she's the trigger and she almost never is. Don't waste your Mora, upgrade a Thunder Soother set for her instead. It's an incredibly flexible set that works for physical builds, electro builds, overload builds, pretty much everything. As for overload builds, Deluke has a similar problem when it comes to being paired with either a Fischl or Beidou. However, the Witch's set is still fantastic on him because the second half of the 4 set bonus that gives him the additional pyro damage whenever he uses his skill ability just gives him really good raw numbers. Pretty much the only time he's going to be consistently the trigger character is in a melt comp where you have like a Chong Yun so you can apply cryo first with your auto attacks and then press your ability buttons. However, if you're running Klee as you're carrying an overload comp, Witches is probably a bad set for her. This is because in an overload comp, she is basically always going to be the aura character, meaning the passive doesn't apply. Everything Klee does just sets on fire. Instead, the elemental mastery as well as any reaction set, so probably Thundering Fury for an overload comp should be going on the trigger character, normally your Fischl or your Beidou. However, ever, if you are using either a Bennett or Zhang Ling carry, they apply Pyro much more slowly than Fischl applies Electro, so Electro becomes the aura element. You can see how this starts being a case-by-case -case thing, you just have to figure out for yourself. Again, I could keep going through all of these different examples, but it always changes depending on your team comp, on the timings of when you proc your abilities, etc. So the important thing is that you understand the core principle that any reaction damage related stuff has to be put on your trigger character and figure out who the trigger characters in your composition are. And then you stack elemental mastery as well as levels on them and you probably don't even need to worry about increasing their attack because their job is going to be triggering these reactions. I've always called these particular characters the sub-carry in a team because their job is to sub for the carry by providing the reactions the carry wants to have. Now, because the ability damage doesn't matter nearly as much as the damage of the reactions a subcarry provides, you generally don't have to worry about putting attack or things like that on them. You can if you want to, but that's expensive and you should probably be investing those resources into your other supports or into your carry. The important thing for these subcarries is normally going to be elemental mastery and also energy regen if they are reliant on their ultimates to keep up the elemental applications they want. And in the case of something like a superconductor build where you care about the debuff and not really the damage, I would just go straight energy regen for like a Kaya subcarry with a razor, for example. The more Kaya can ult, the more he can apply superconductor and the damage doesn't really matter that much anyway on superconductor. And this is part of the reason why transformative reaction comps are very popular because they are relatively cheap to make. Because you don't have to try to get a really good artifact set with like attack percentage, crit percentage, etc. on your sub carry, you just need levels and elemental mastery or energy regen. It just costs you so many less resources that you can instead be investing into your carries or into your burst damage supports. Now, one thing to keep in mind in terms of who you put elemental mastery on, 99% of the time, Nemo characters just love elemental mastery. Just remember the Venera set, if you have access to it, is still the priority for Nemo supports. Geo supports, on the other hand, EM is nice because it makes your shields tankier, but it's questionable whether you really want that or not. Similar to the Nemo supports, the important part is the artifact set bonus of having the four-piece Petra, so get that first and foremost. So then, now that we know who to put the elemental mastery on, how much do we put on there? And the answer is pretty much as much as you can fit. So in the early testing days of this game, I was told by a few different 
sources that EM has a very sharp drop off past 200 EM. However, in the Reddit post that we mentioned earlier, again, link in the description, they have done massive data plots of testing showing that the curve is almost linear. It does go down by a little bit, but not too much. So yeah, just stack as much EM as you possibly can on all of your elemental trigger characters. Now, the last thing I want to briefly discuss in this basics guide is talking about the instructor set specifically. This is because early and even late game, this is a very popular set to run on all of your sub carries. But it is important to know that it is also mistranslated. So this set bonus for four pieces says that when we use our elemental skill, our E ability, we give 120 elemental mastery to our entire team. This is not actually how it works. How it actually works is that when a character with instructors triggers an elemental reaction while they are on the field, they give this buff to their teammates. This does not necessarily mean you have to reuse your ability to make this work. So if Fischl pops her bird, then you switch off of her, but then you switch back to her and her bird triggers an elemental reaction, you get the bonus. Now this does not make the instructor set bad, it simply means you have to play it correctly. In other words, whenever your sub carry with instructors does pop their abilities, you have to make sure they trigger a reaction before you leave the field if you want that buff. Alright, that about does it for all the basics of elemental reaction and as well as how elemental mastery works in this game. I hope you learned something new because this was meant to be kind of a crash course masterclass on all of the basics of the reaction mechanics in the game. I do have planned some future videos going more in-depth with the nuances, the mathematics, as well as also ideal team comps and how to build stuff based off of this information. So be sure to like the video and leave a comment below on any of those particular topics you'd be interested in seeing me cover. And if you have any friends who'll be interested in learning how elemental reactions, the elemental system, and all of these things work, which, let's be honest, is probably most of them, then be sure to share the video with them as well. And if you have any off-stream questions for me, feel free to ping me over in our Discord server, The Mathalos Nest. I try to respond to every ping I get. And a lot of this information I did learn from the library of data from the R Caching Mains Discord server, so link in the description to their Discord server as well. All other sources used in the video, including my own master spreadsheet that's kind of a mess but has stuff on it, is also going to be in the description. And of course, a huge thank you again to our patrons who continue to generously support us even though I took about a four-month hiatus from making video content. Alright, that's all I have for this video. I am not planning on streaming tonight on the day this video comes out. However, I will be on stream with my channel partner Tuna Taco over at twitch.tv slash Tuna Taco. He hasn't really gotten into Genshin yet, so we're gonna start that up and I'm gonna join him for that journey. Be sure to go shoot him a follow if you want to know when we go live. Alright, so we do have lots more videos coming out. I will be streaming on YouTube kind of randomly when I feel like it, so be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell, and that way YouTube will let you know as soon as I go live on stream on YouTube or if any new videos come out. Neato. Happy waifu hunting whalers, we'll see you in the next one. Bye!